My interest in the history of music started when I first heard blues originals of heavy rock songs by Cream, Led Zeppelin and a handful of other groups I was listening to in my teens. I was blown away to hear, for example, Outside Woman Blues by Blind Joe Reynolds, a song made famous by Cream. I was 18 then when I heard that, the same year I started the Top 100. I set out on a quest to find originals, not just of rock music classics, but of just about everything, all music that interested me. The Top 100 is a record of these searches. The blues had some ancestry coming from Africa and my geographical musical field of interest expanded rapidly. Musical recordings, of course, only go back to the end of the 19th century, but many ethnographical recordings seem to have been part of more ancient traditions. My ultimate quest then became to find the origins of music, which in truth is a, is a futile activity, a sheer impossibility, but it's a quest that continued to map out my path seeking out the sounds and stories of musical recordings from all over the world. The origins of music then, the topic of this video. The sheer impossibility of answering the question of how music started doesn't keep me from pondering it and reading up on literature of professional scholars who have tackled the issue. I'm collecting their quotes and copies of their recordings that now make up a good deal of the top 100 lists. I've been keeping a notebook on my computer into which I jot down ideas, observations and links to and titles of related scholarly materials. I'll read you the first two entry points. These are about my own history and music. One, as a child I had no musical ability whatsoever, no ear for notes, no sense of rhythm. It didn't keep me from being interested in music and, as a teenager, I learned to play an instrument. During a five or six year stretch since I started, I gradually developed an ear. Not that I became an excellent musician or acquired absolute pitch, but I could hold a beat and I could hold a note. 2. The few years as a teenager when I was playing guitar in a rock and roll band provided me with some of the best memories of my life. The feeling of being in a flow together with others is the feeling of life having meaning, getting lost into something bigger than yourself, lost in the folds of time, a paradox. Mm -hmm. That what provides meaning to one's life, that what makes you feel alive, is when you are getting lost, when you cease to be a rational person. The concept of I think, therefore I am turned upside down. Because of my own experience with music, I believe that the feeling of flow is essential to the concept of music. The flow, the gelling, implies that it's essential for music that it involves more than one person. Laughter is a natural response to people in unison. Yet, I don't believe that playing together is necessarily a key to the essence of music. The first thing to do when thinking about the essence of music, or its origin, is to define the term music. What is music? This question too has had many scholars and musical theorists musing in an attempt to answer. To John Cage, for example, the essence of music is sound. Sound, of course, is everywhere at all times, and what makes it music to Cage is the awareness of sound, consciousness, the will to music. Music is about everything that contains sound, immensely broad, and the musicians aren't necessarily humans either. The scholar Stephen Mithen came up with a novel explanation. In his book The Singing Neanderthals, Mithen forwards the hypothesis that music precedes our species and that Neanderthals, if not even more ancient hominids, were already creating music. For Mithen, music preceded language, and language to him is an inhibiting factor to musical expression. Mithen claims that every infant born into the world as absolute pitch, only to use it as years progress. Christopher Roberts, a classical trained musician who traveled to Papua New Guinea to study ethnological musical tradition, 
realize that every individual of the Wopkai people of central New Guinea was a composer. The Wopkai grew up with song as equal to language, if not more important, and never dislearned the innate ability of pitch, rhythm and composition. The Wopkai sang all day, at least they used to until the 1980s when Western-style economic development encroached on their remote territory. Robots, as does Mitten, thus believes that the harmonizing principle between individuals is innate to the human genes. In the film Sound, double question marks, by Chris Fontaine from 1966, which is narrated by John Cage, Rassan Roland Kirk is seen handing out penny whistles to the audience and invite them to play along. The result is at first a cacophony of noise, but gradually gels into a unified chorus. The film, by the way, is attempting to answer a question Cage poses, what is sound? Cage himself answers it by asking many more questions. The more I think about the origin of music, the more I read about it, the more I come to realize that there is no answer to the origin of music question, at least not as a singular event that took place somewhere in history. What does have an origin is the naming of music. Certain sounds are considered more music than others, and these sounds is what we consider music, and that has a history and thus an origin. I guess for convenience sake, I like to consider music the deliberate or organized sequence of sounds. The definition makes music the property of humankind. Birds sing too, but only humans, presumably, organized and are conscious in doing so. There is no singular origin story of music, maybe there's none whatsoever, or there could be several simultaneously. Let's break down music into several categories, and later on their various functions too. Some categories seem to be more susceptible to assigning a possible origin story than others. I propose these binary categories for independent investigation. 1. Sacred music versus secular music. 2. Instrumental music versus vocal music. 3. Individual versus group. 4. Male versus female. 1. Sacred secular. My leaning in interpreting the role of music in the human psyche, or the origin of music, is greatly influenced by reading George Bataille about expenditure. Bataille believes art's origin is the sacred. The sacred to Bataille is a state of complete abandon. Mircea Iliad too, although less violently, deducts that the essence of art is a state of trance, when humans connect with the spirit of the eternal, a state of timelessness. Time does not exist, and neither does death. The separation of the genders does not exist either, the sacred is a state in which life is undivided, eternal. Exaltation when acting out a spirit, the inner voice of the spirit easily shifts genders. The male shaman in falsetto, the female shaman uses low registers that throat singing produces. Children lose themselves in play. The result? Laughter. To lose oneself is at the core of music, to lose oneself to become the other, to become a spirit, to become God. One of the musical traditions I have become infatuated with in recent years is the Inuit Katayak. A Katayak is a game song typically performed by two women or children. A Katayak is a short song of call and response, throat singing, that ends when one of the two starts to laugh. Both Jean-Jacques Nathias and Nicole Baudry both scholars and recorders of Inuit musical traditions stress that the Inuits themselves do not consider katayat, which is the plural of katayak, music at all, but rather games. 
Katayat are secular games, just like there are other games that do not depend on sound. Music to the Inuit is more serious. The highest form of music are sacred songs. The function of games, I suppose, is to prepare children for the important task key to the survival of a people in adulthood. Back to Joris Bataille again. In Lasco, or The Birth of Art, a book from 1955, he places play as an essential condition for art. He opposes play with work. Play is expenditure. Resources are lost, nothing is gained. Work's function is to gain, to achieve a certain goal. It would make sense, considering this, that play would happen when a culture has ample of resources available to expand. The development of art and music, as an analogy, must have occurred when cultures were relatively prosperous. Music, like art, would need ample of idle time and a full stomach. Throughout recorded history, musical and artistic tradition flourished when a culture was well off. I wouldn't expect it to be any different in ancient and prehistoric times. Certain cultures do better than others. Even separate cultures bordering one another, while a certain degree of cultural cross-pollination naturally happens, may have very different traditions of music. The body painting of the Colombias in Ecuador for example, have greater aesthetic quality than that of the Givaro. Yet the designs are similar. Crude are the Givaro designs compared to those of the Columbia Indians. According to my theory of uh, prosperity, it would follow that the Columbias fared better than the Givaro. This, however, is not supported by any evidence from the ethnological academic record. The differences in complexity and aesthetics are striking, though. Something else is going on, clearly. Perhaps the development of a tradition could be initiated by a single, talented individual. Given the right circumstances of freedom allotted to individuals, one individual could very well be responsible for altering a tradition and enhance its complexity. The tradition would be carried over to the next generations. The Columbia Indians may have simply valued aesthetics higher than the Givaro, like how the Greeks valued aesthetics more than the stronger Romans did. Compare the music of the Givaro, or Shuar, rather, the proper designation of these people, to that of the Columbias. The opposite appears to have happened. The music of the Shuar is simply more complex and refined than that of the Columbias. Maybe at some point, in the history of the Givaro, a gifted composer pushed the song repertoire of the group to a high level. The repertoire sticks, and this repertoire could last for many generations. Especially, it seems, when things aren't written down but trans transmitted orally. A recording of a song made in 1956 of a man is identical to a woman's song from the 1970s. And it's just not the same song and the same melody, the song is truly identical, every detail about it. Remarkable, given how the Givaro's social structure separates the genres. Memory persists. Oral traditions of illiterate societies seem to persist over hundreds, if not thousands of years. In Chuxi song of Siberia, as well as in the traditions of many other cultures, Remnants are found of expressions that are not in use anymore in their language. Albert Lord, studying the epic poetry of the Balkan regions, discovered that oral transmission of language is an excellent form of information communication. Stories and knowledge can be transmitted from generation to generation, spanning hundreds, if not thousands of years. Homer was illiterate, it is claimed. I'm getting off topic here. The previous section discusses development, not an origin. Back to the topic of origin now and back to the points I laid out earlier. Number two on that list was the item instrumental versus vocal. It is clear to me that vocal music preceded instrumental music. The history of instruments can, in most cases, be traced back to the body, either as an extension of the voice or 
and percussion instruments the percussive quality of various parts of the body. Rhythms occur naturally, walking, breathing, the heartbeat, etc. The origin of vocal music is, I believe, much more ancient and cannot be traced back to anything tangible, really. It seems like it was always there. And I'll take Mithen's hypothesis that it was there already before our species even appeared on the face of the earth. In the ethnomusicology record, early on, three cultures were singled out as being the most primitive. Back in the 1910s, Professor von Hornborsel identified the Andanamese and Veda from islands of the Indian coast, the Andaman Islands and Sri Lanka respectively, as well as the Ona people of Fire Island at the southern point of South America as the most primitive. Indeed, these cultures locations had not been contacted by Western civilizations for a very long time. A characteristic of the music of these places is that they have no instruments. The music is vocal only. The sounds that were recorded coming from people that have been isolated and uncontacted, such as the Andanamese, are extremely outlandish compared to the sounds of cultures that were in contact with the West or with one another. Contact between different groups of people means refinement of cultural expression. The music of mingling people is more cultured than that of isolated peoples. The origins of music, music in its purest state, is perhaps only hinted at by the outlandish sounds of isolated peoples. But ancient people, like us now in a global economy, were not isolated at all. They were in contact with others. They interpret and influence one another. Perhaps the outlandish sounds of the only Andalamese recording that there is is a result of their separation. The music perhaps did not evolve and by lack of innovators devolved into what we in the West like to call primitive. Who knows, it's all speculations. So what do I want out of it? What is my motivation? Is it fame, recognition, to be taken seriously? I honestly don't know. I came to like ethnographic music because I was bored with much of Western popular music. I do not think of ethnographic music as primitive, but I do think of it as closer related to the origin or essence of music than most popular music is. My motivation is perhaps a longing for what Mariana Torgovnik critiques in Gone Primitive, the oceanic or ecstasy. She also suggests that ethnography, the primitive, may not be the right place to find it. She's probably right.